It's been great pleasure uh, to invite our firm and fellow to uh, Dr. Pat Mummery, who is a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at UCL. He's chair of the NIHR Dementia Translational Research Collaboration, and head of clinical trials at UCL's Dementia Research Centre, and also deputy director of the Leonard Wolfson Experimental Neurology Centre. And this focuses on early phase clinical trials. Uh, Kat has been chief investigator for over 20 early phase clinical trials of potentially disease modifying agents for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Uh, I'm particularly excited by the positive title of her talk today, uh, Emerging Therapies in Dementia, the New Era. So, over to you, Kat. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, thank you so much to the uh, organizers for inviting me to give this talk. It's already been an incredibly rich morning. We've gone from basic science and nanomolecules to, to well-being and, and um, computer games. So I hope I continue the level of interest that those have already had. So I'm a clinician. I'm a trialist. And as you heard, I've been doing trials for 16 plus years now. Um, and so this will be a very clinical patient-focused talk. And basically what I want to try and convince you over the next 35 minutes or so is that we really are at the beginning of a new era in treatments in dementia, and particularly in Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to focus on Alzheimer's disease because the joy of doing trials these days is I've got too much to talk about for 40 minutes, whereas about five years ago it would have been short talk. So I'm going to try and go through the first part of my talk, some of the developments that we've seen in Alzheimer's disease recently. And then towards the end, I'll just briefly mention the, the, the need for us to really think about our clinical services. Because if we have treatments, that's great. But if we have treatments and no way of giving them, then that's a tragedy. So that's what I'm going to try and set out to do today. We talk about hope a lot when we're thinking about our participants, and you just ha heard about well-being and volunteering and altruism and how those things can increase people's well-being. Well, one of the things participants hope happens when they go into a study is that, firstly, they have an altruistic hope, and secondly, of course, they hope they're going to get a drug that actually makes a difference. Um, so we think about hope when we're talking about what happens with our participant. This is a picture by George Watt, and this is hope sitting on top of a globe blindfolded, and she's playing a lyre, and all of the strings except for one are broken. And, and he was charged with perhaps painting despair and not hope. He countered, saying, hope doesn't require expectation. It's not optimism. Hope just requires that an outcome is possible. So it's possible that she can play music with a lyre with just one string. And in fact, if you think about things that are almost impossible, that's where hope really carries you through. And what I would say is that the past 20 years in trials, hope has been a very big part of what's kept people going after year after year of failed trials. But what I would say now, we've now got the beginnings and the foundations that we can build on, and therefore, we don't just have to be hopeful now. We can afford to be optimistic, to have some expectation. But it's been a long, old road. So there have been many years, and you all have heard many of the stories and the hyperbole in the press of multiple negative trials. And there's been an awful lot of debate over that time whether we should be pursuing anti-amyloid therapies, whether indeed the amyloid hypothesis is something that is accurate. And the first signal that that might not be the case, that we might actually have something in these anti-amyloid therapies, was this a drug called aducanumab. You all know the controversy. So this drug in the phase one trial showed a positive signal in terms of removing amyloid and associated with that hint, but it's a phase one trial, of a change in cognition related to that. So they went all gun blazing, never mind doing a phase two and making sure this was actually the case. They went straight into phase three, two trials. And those trials were stopped early because it was felt that, they, that futility had been met. In other words, they weren't doing anything. And there was then a huge complexity of data analysis, um, FDA filing, and eventually an accelerated approval by the FDA. And we could argue about that all day, but we won't. And this led to a massive controversy and debate within the research um, community. And in fact, it threatened to derail a lot of research in terms of clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease because of the level of polarization within it. But fortunately, we then had some other successes that came along. So lecanemab was produced by ESI in conjunction with Biogen, 
And this, again, is an anti-amyloid antibody. And this antibody showed categorically in a phase three trial that you can reduce levels of amyloid in the brain significantly. Um, and associated with that, you can slow down cognitive decline modestly by about 27%. And it got full approval, first disease-modifying therapy in Alzheimer's disease to get full approval in January of this year in the U.S. It's undergoing approvals process at the moment in Europe. And hot on the heels of, of the Kenby was Denanumab. So the results from Denanumab came out in July 2023, so at the last AIC conference with lots of pomp and ceremony. And again, this showed reduction of amyloid leads to some slowing of cognitive decline. So I'll come back to those results in a second, but we have a foundation. It's not the best foundation, but it is a beginning that we can then build on. And just going through those results briefly, so this is Lakembi, and the results here are the cognitive results on CDR3 boxes, so that's a cognitive and functional score, and after 18 months on drug versus placebo, there is a statistically significant difference, which is about 27% slowing of decline. So what does that actually mean? The numbers don't mean anything to a patient if you're in a clinic. What are you going to tell them if you give them this drug? Well, you're going to say that over 18 months, what we've seen on average is that you might see several months at a better level over that 18-month period than you would if you were on placebo. And that's around five months. And that's something that people can actually understand. So it's something we can use in those discussions. Associated with that, there was a dramatic lowering of amyloid. So by three months, it was already significant. By 18 months, these people didn't have enough amyloid in the brain, as according to PET scans, to actually enter the study in the first place. So they'd lowered their levels to around 25, 20 centimeters of standard measure on PET. Secondary outcome measures were similar and consistent, suggesting that that primary outcome is supported. And importantly, care burden was reduced. And I think this is another meaningful thing that people can take home from these studies. But again, I want to come back to these results are modest. These people are still progressing. They're not curing anything. Denanumab showed very similar results. They would say they showed better results than the Canamab would say the same. But Denanumab, if you look at their whole population that went into the trial, so that's whether they had low, medium tau or high tau, they were stratified on the way into the trial on PET scans. The whole population, very similar results on CDR from the box. is the primary outcome on the other study and secondary on this. They showed better results in the lower tau population. And this suggests perhaps that we should be giving these drugs earlier than we are at the moment. So, over the course of a number of anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies, including gantanarumab, aducanumab, and the two I've just spoken about, what have we learned about what we need to do with amyloid? Well, this is a concatenation of the different results from each study. So that's denanumab lowering of amyloid on PET. This is the canumab lowering of amyloid on PET. That's the positive aducanumab study. That's the negative aducanumab study, and that's the negative gantanarumab study. And what we've seen is that across all of these, if you lower amyloid quickly, if you keep it down for long enough over the course of the trial, and you keep it down at low enough, and people talk about around 20 centimoids and certainly below 25 centimoids, then you start to see a change in cognitive function. Of course, if you're going to give these drugs, you better make sure they're safe. And this is the biggest part of discussion in terms of safety or otherwise. So this is REAE, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. And this person is in a trial, and they're showing this increase in light flyer to low with high signal, but then resolves when the drug is paused. And they then go back onto the drug, and they're fine. They have no symptoms, despite the dramatic appearance of that. And most people have no symptoms. Most people have this within the first six months. That's the window when we have to be really careful when we're giving these drugs. It is dose-related, and importantly, there's an increased risk with APOE4 that is significant. We think, coming back to the immune system that David was talking about before, we think that this is an immune-mediated flux in and out of the amyloid at the beginning of treatment, in and out of the blood vessels that leads to friability in these issues. This is what happens in clinic if you're not careful. So this person was on placebo and then went on to the open label study. They just started drugs within their first six months of treatment, which means that they're more at risk of issues. They then developed symptoms that might have been a stroke, 
So they went to A&E. A&E did a CT scan, which isn't going to show up these sorts of things. And they said they, they've had a stroke. We're going to give them thrombolysis. So they gave them thrombolysis. That person then had seizures, deteriorated quickly, and died, and had huge numbers of bleeds with swelling in the brain that you can see on post-mortem. Thrombolysis doesn't go well with friable blood vessels, and we've just started an anti-amyloid therapy. One of the things we have to be really careful about with these therapies as they come to practice is ensuring that we talk through risks, that everybody in the clinical team is understanding of what that person is on and might happen. We suspect that because they didn't have an MRI scan, they didn't see any abnormalities because you wouldn't see it on a CT, you only see it on an MRI, and they gave thrombolysis when they wouldn't have done if they'd had that conversation with the neurologist that was giving the treatment. So there is an awful lot that we need to learn in the coming years about what's safe, what's not safe, and how to do things. And there are many questions, these are just a few. So if we give this treatment, does it continue to improve? Does it have a cumulative effect, or does it not? When do we give it? And I suggested earlier might be better. Importantly, when do we stop it? That discussion is so difficult that none of the advice recommendations for these drugs actually mention when we should stop it yet. How do we predict ARIA and how do we predict who's going to have the significant problems is a critical question for us. And these, these people are still progressing. So we're going to need combination therapies. Importantly, as I've just alluded to, how do we give these drugs appropriately and safely in our current service? And I'll come back to that. So combination treatment. This is a pipeline of every drug in trial in Alzheimer's disease as of June of this year. And what you'll see is that these are the disease-modifying therapies in purple and green, so the vast majority are disease-modifying. Phase 1 safety trials are out of circle. Phase 2 safety and some efficacy target engagement. And Phase 3 efficacy regulatory trials that will then go to filing for approval. Only one year ago, that there, the biologics that disease modify, was all red. In other words, every drug was an anti-amyloid therapy. And now you have other targets that are being looked at that have got to that late stage. That's really encouraging. So diversity is increasing in the targets we're looking at. And you can see there's a huge array of targets that are now being explored in Alzheimer's disease, inflammation being one of them. Um, we know now that we've got lots more methodologies. It's not just about neuroimmunotherapy. And we are finally engaging in milder stages, so going into preclinical and prodromal. And finally, using biomarkers to define diseases that could go into these studies and then as outcome. Up until six or seven years ago, trials were not defining patients with Alzheimer's disease by their biomarkers. They were just defining them by their clinical appearance. And a third of them didn't have Alzheimer's disease. It's not very surprising some of those trials were negative. Coming back before I finish on amyloid. So we've talked about immunotherapies that mop up those proteins that we were hearing about from David earlier in his talk. But what about if we go upstream? If we decrease the production of those proteins in the first place? And gene silencing, as you know, is one method where we can try and do that. Um, this method is one of two I'll mention today, so interference RNA, and this is a synthetic oligonucleotide that effectively hijacks that cell's normal machinery that regulates gene expression. It binds to the risk RNA silencing complex, and it pairs it with the unwanted mRNA, so in this case, one that's produced from APC gene, and prevents it being translated into protein. So you reduce the amount of protein in a dosable way. And we know from genetics in human genetics that if you have an increased dose of APC, you're more likely to get AD. If you have mutations that reduce APP expression, you're less likely to get AD. And if you knock out APP, what if we do reduce production of APP here? Then you don't, at the moment, you don't see any clear phenotype. But previous work with base inhibitors in Alzheimer's disease did suggest that lowering these things could potentially cause memory problems. So one of the things we need to be very careful about with this first interference RNA is that we're monitoring memory really closely as we go through the trial. So this trial we started earlier this, this year. This is a first in human trial. So the first people in the world being dosed are those with mild Alzheimer's disease. We're using young onset Alzheimer's disease because they have more likely a problem with production, overproduction, rather than impaired clearance of these proteins. And 
they were mildly affected and confirmed by pathology, either on CFS or PAT. The first part of the trial is a placebo-controlled single ascending dose trial. So you're seeing very, very early results that are blinded because this trial is still going on. First three cohorts of six have been conducted. And what happens is they get one dose. Now, these drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so you have to give them intrathecally via a lumbar puncture. So this person has one lumbar puncture here and is given the dose, and then they have multiple lumbar punctures, and it is a lot of lumbar punctures to ask one person to have in a trial over six months. You then monitor the changes in terms of fragments of APP, the pharmacokinetics, but primarily you're making sure that things are safe in terms of using these drugs. And we are now at the stage where we're starting the multiple dose part, having completed the first three cohorts. And so far, the drug is well tolerated, and there have been no safety signals. So this just very briefly shows you, and the graphs are actually identical, so I'll just focus on one. This is two APP fragments, alpha and beta. If you look across here, this is time to six months. Sorry, the numbers are small. And this is percentage change in the CSF fragment. So the placebo group here is in red. Low-dose group here is in blue. You're not seeing any significant difference. The two higher-dose groups here, 50 and 75, show a significant reduction in those fragments, which after one injection is then sustained over around six months and continuing, which is a very long response to that one injection, part because we think that siRNA is working in a catalytic fashion. So the question is, if you're reducing a production of APP, then when do you need to do that? When should you be giving these amyloid therapies? By the time you've got symptoms, you've got a head full of amyloid. And if you look at mutation carriers, you get a good idea of when that pathology starts. So here you see mutation carriers um, with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease and non-carriers at the same time in advance of their estimated year of onset, which we know well with these genetic diseases. And what you can see on amyloid PET is a buildup of amyloid up to 20 years before they get any symptoms. So that gives you a window of opportunity where we really need to think about certainly in genetic diseases, what we can do to prevent the production of those symptoms and in fact of disease. And that's something that we are now increasingly looking at. So the DIAN-TU trial platform has been going now for over 10 years. This is a master platform where you have multiple drug arms, which you can see here. And over time, as your understanding grows, and as um, the technologies increase, you can start to adapt and put multiple arms into the trial. So here we started with anti-amyloid immunotherapies. That was the only thing in town 10 years ago. And now we're starting to look at anti-tau therapies. And the first one is about to start. I'll come back to that in a minute. But this is secondary prevention. So these individuals, no symptoms, at risk of autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. We start a treatment trying to prevent the onset of symptoms in them. One of the difficulties with these trials is they are very, very long, as you can imagine, because these are people with mild early disease. They take a long time to progress. But what about if we could actually prevent disease in the first place? So having spent 10 years looking at secondary prevention, we are just about to start this trial in people with genetic mutations that will lead to Alzheimer's disease. And again, we know they're going to get it if we can't prevent it. So this is, we can help with brain resilience, but we're not going to stop disease. So these people are at least 11 years before they get any symptoms. They have negative amyloid scans, and we're about to start giving them a drug to try and stop that buildup of amyloid in the first place and see if that can stop disease. All sorts of ethical questions come up about doing this at some point, not least, if you think about the aria that I just showed you, those imaging abnormalities, the good news is if you haven't got amyloid in your brain, then aria is not going to happen. So they actually don't have the risk that people have that have aria in the brain. Changing from amyloid to inflammation, you heard from David um, beautifully in his talk earlier around the importance of inflammation in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. And there, it's a much more juvenile approach in terms of trials. It's not been around for very long, but there have been some amazing advances in other disorders that we can try and borrow from. The first attempt, the first method that we're trying to use to reduce inflammation is enhance the genetic modulation. So we know TRAM2 is a key risk gene in Alzheimer's disease. We know it modulates inflammation. 
if we can agonize function by using a monoclonal antibody and immunotherapy, perhaps we can reduce the chronic inflammation that occurs and therefore reduce deposition of proteins. And following the phase one results, which suggested that this was possible from the CSF findings, we started a phase two trial of three doses against placebo using cognitive functional tests and biomarkers to see if we could engage target, whether this was safe, and dose model, importantly, for a larger study. Study started two years ago. We just completed recruitment. And this is a monthly infusion. So they come in every month from infusion. They have a number of tests across time. And we will get results of this trial in 2025. Again, something that's important that wasn't necessarily fully expected when the study was first started was in a group of people, they developed significant RAE, which I showed you earlier. And in fact, it was very much in the APOE4 group. And the, the APOE4 group was therefore excluded from the trial. And very few people get RAE who are not APOE4. So this gives us a lot to think about in terms of RAE and the mechanism, because this drug has a different mechanism. And the APOE4 group and what's happening with them, but also practically, what are we going to do with people that are APOE4 with these various drugs safely? And the second method we're using really borrows from cancer. So checkpoint inhibitors have made a huge difference to cancer therapies. And Michael Schwartz has done a lot of work over a number of years in immunotherapies and um, modulation of the immune system, trying to reduce senescence or aging of the immune system. And so her methodology has now been adapted to use a checkpoint inhibitor, an anti-PDL1 antibody, to try and reverse the senescence that you get in the peripheral immune system and therefore lead to a cascade that enhances the immune response and enhances clearance and phagocytosis of the abnormal proteins within the brain and therefore slows disease. Now, the joy of this is, this is not reliant on having a drug through the blood-brain barrier. It has a peripheral effect, which you can measure peripherally, um, and it gives you therefore a more reliable change within the CNS because, and a more reliable peripheral monitoring of what's happening. So it's, it's, it's a very different method to trial. We started this very recently. Again, this is a first in human trials. The first people in the world are being given the drug. We've given eight people the drug so far, globally, across my site and Israel. So we've got to bear in the schema. Basically what happens is you have an ascending set of doses and you have a safety monitoring committee at each dose. And if things are safe on that dose, you then start to give multiple doses and go to the higher dose in another cohort. Um, these individuals so far, all eight, have been, have tolerated this treatment extremely well. We've passed this point and are now about to start this point. As you can see, this is really early days. I don't have data to show you as yet. Um, but what we have to think about is the potential adverse events that happen with cancer. They get a lot of immune-related adverse events. This drug has been engineered, and the dosing of it has been engineered to try and minimize that. But clearly, we need to be really careful about what we're doing with these drugs. Um, and we have oncology specialists who've spent many years looking at these that are on our safety monitoring committees and advising us to try and ensure that we are as safe as possible. The third option I want to talk about is tau. So this is, as we know, is absolutely critical in terms of the course of Alzheimer's disease. Unlike when your symptoms start and you have a head full of amyloid, tau correlates in terms of spread and deposition with symptom progression and severity. And so if we can try and suppress or clear tau, perhaps we can prevent the progression from tau, but also prevent the amyloid-induced toxicity that usually comes with tau. And it gives us a different therapeutic window. It is later, potentially, than the anti-amyloid therapies in terms of opportunity. There are multiple treatments that are now being tried in AD and in PSP. Look how many dominant immunotherapy treatments. I think this was partly because the sort of jump on the bandwagon of the number of immunotherapies there were in anti-amyloid treatments. But there are other methods as well. So aggregation inhibition, and tau reduction is the thing I'm going to spend a little time talking about. This is one of the passive immunotherapy treatments, these monoclonal antibodies against tau that's being explored. And there have been a number so far and a wide range of strategies from promiscuous ones that target every, every tau epitope to ones that are very specific, but they've all been negative so far. 
And the question is whether that's because they've been targeting the wrong epitopes. This particular drug, which was um, developed by my friend and colleague, Rohan Silva at UCL, targets part of the domain which is deemed competent and path competent and therefore the hope is that that will actually do something that um, leads to a positive outcome. But this drug, of course, is targeting the extracellular towers. It tries to spread. The aim is to reduce spread by doing so. The phase one data suggested that it could reduce tower in the CSF. We then put it into a phase 1b trial in patients with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And that's been going now for two years. And it's a very small trial. The aim here is to try and dose model for another trial, which I'll talk about in a second. I don't have results on this as yet, but we know that it's been well tolerated in those seven people that have gone into it. And again, these are tiny numbers. Phase one trials are small, not like the phase three trials that have hundreds and thousands of people in them. They have a very different purpose. The aim of the results of this is to try and refine the dose design of a study that's in that master platform I was telling you about earlier. So I mentioned secondary prevention, and I mentioned as looking at anti-tail therapies. That will be the first one that we'll look at. I want to tell you about in a minute is likely to be a second one. But things have just got more complicated because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we now have approved anti-amyloid immunotherapy. So do we need to add that into these trials as well? And what does that mean if we do that? In this trial, the decision was taken, rightly or wrongly, to give everybody anti-amyloid immunotherapy and then to give them placebo or anti-tau drug on top. Clearly, that makes things much more complex in terms of your safety data. It makes things much more complex in terms of your efficacy data. But I have to say, giving people a drug that I know has, has a benefit is the first time I've ever been able to do that in Alzheimer's disease in 30 years. And not only I, but the participants absolutely think that's fantastic. So in that respect, even if it's a modest change, that's an extraordinary thing to be able to do, provided it's safe. Final thing I want to talk about, it comes back to genetic therapies. So you will know the spinal muscular atrophy story. You will know the impact that drugs in gene silencing that modulate splicing and genetic spinal muscular atrophy has made a massive change in these families. And there are increasing neurodegenerative diseases where gene silencing and other therapies are making significant impact. And just to give you an example of the sort of impact this can have. So this is the Lee family. They have five children. Three of them have infantile spinal muscular atrophy, which kills you by the age of two to four. This is Jocelyn, born in 2007. She died before they could get any treatment because it didn't exist at that point in time. This is Nathan. He's on a ventilator wheelchair. He's six years old. He's on treatment, but we can't reverse the damage. And coming back to Barbara's point earlier about prevention and also about early treatment, we can't reverse the damage that has happened. So this is as good as it gets for him. This is his sister, Kira. She's two. She was diagnosed in utero. She started in treatment at birth. She has no symptoms. She has normal motor milestones. She's effectively cured. So this isn't nudging the needle a little bit to the left and giving people a few months. This is potentially making a massive difference to at least genetic diseases. And the potential to do something like that in dementia is really exciting. Clearly, non-genetic diseases are much more complex, but can we use these genetic silencing therapies in non-genetic diseases such as Alzheimer's disease? And this is the first example in Alzheimer's disease. And there were previous ones in HD, which is the first in Alzheimer's disease. This is an anti stem cell of the nucleotide that targets the MAT2 gene, so the tau gene. So, as you will know, effectively, that's a synthetic short oligonucleotide that recognizes the mRNA, binds to it with what's in the base pairing, and it then prevents it from being translated into the protein. We don't know which species of tau are toxic. So, if we can get all of them in all compartments, that's a pragmatic solution, as long as it's dosable and reversible. The pre thing that. Is that my time up? <laughs> the preclinical work suggests that lowering tau is safe. There aren't clear phenotypes from genetic knockouts, and lowering mice in preclinical hasn't led to behavioral or neuroanatomical changes. And this was some really beautiful work in preclinical in, in PS19 mice that accumulate tau abnormally by Sarah DeVos in Tim Miller's lab. 
And what she showed, giving them this ASO, this antisense oligonucleotide, which is red versus gray, and she showed a reduction in tau accumulation. She also showed a reversal of existing tau deposition. She showed an improvement in survival rate, and she showed an associated improvement in behavior, nesting behavior in this case. And so based on this preclinical work, we went into the phase one trial. So this phase one trial is in mild Alzheimer's disease. It started in 2017. I dosed the first patient. This was the first time we'd used a gene science treatment of any type in Alzheimer's disease. I have to tell you that I was extremely nervous. Um, but the first results, the first, the first um, outcome measure for this, of course, was safety. We wanted to look at some exploratory measures. Now, this is back in 2017, so we didn't have personal measures. We had CSF tau. And we, halfway through the trial, we had tau pep. We didn't have that at the beginning of this either. Things have changed very quickly in recent years. The study population was 46 people in total globally, 35 of which got treatment in the placebo-controlled trial, mild Alzheimer's disease, and they were confirmed on CSF markers as having pathology that was consistent. So in terms of the multiple ascending dose first part of the study, so some got placebo, some got drug, three to one, in terms of the proportions. In the first three cohorts, ascending doses are 10, 30, 60. They had monthly intrathecal injections, so these are lumbar punctures again. In the fourth cohort, they had quarterly injections. So over, the, over that um, three-month period, they just had two injections, the others had four. And all of them were invited to go into long-term extension. In the second two cohorts, that was seamless. They went straight through into long-term extension. In the first two, there was some variable gap between that initial treatment period and the long-term extension. In terms of CSF, it was measured every time they had a dose because they were lumbar punctures then given doses with and then through the follow-up. In terms of PET, only the, the bottom two cohorts um, had PET at screening, week 25 and week 100, and I'll show you that tau PET in a second, but it's very small numbers as a result of that. So what do we see? Well, firstly, um, the paper is published, by the way, in Nature Medicine. <laughs> they really don't like me. It was published in Nature Medicine in April, um, but the results of safety was very well tolerated, so no FAEs. Most of the AEs were related to procedure, which if you have several lumbar punctures, perhaps isn't terribly surprising. These are the top line results from the point of view of the CSF tau and phosphor tau. And I'll just orientate you to the graph. So this is reduction um, from baseline in total tau in the spinal fluid and reduction from baseline in phosphor tau 181 in the spinal fluid. And I'll just focus on one because they're almost identical. The multiple ascending dose trial is here. And then the extension trial where all got drug is here. And what you see is placebo group in black and gray. So no change in CSF tau over that initial trial period where they're getting placebo. And you see increasing doses of red, purple, orange, and blue showing a dose-dependent reduction in CSF tau over that period of time. But in the higher levels, it's sustained. And in the lower levels, it seems to show some rebound back up to, more to where it was at the beginning. And when they go on the open label extension, they all get drugged. When they all get drugged, they converge at around a 60% reduction in CSF total tau over that period of time, which again is sustained and it's very similar to phosphor tau. Now that's great. That's the first time a reduction like that has been seen in any of our tau trials of any methodology, which is brilliant. But what does that mean is actually happening in the brain? So these results come with a caveat. These are small numbers because they're only the two cohorts, but they're encouraging and hopefully we'll be able to validate them in bigger trials. So basically, in different regions of the brain, we looked at the change from baseline in the SUV on a tau pet. And so what you see is the gray is people that were on placebo, the went on active drug, and the other two are essentially higher and medium on drug, continued on drug. So you see in all of the groups, there is a clear reduction in the tau burden in all of the regions, but more in the medial temporal and temporal lobes. And this is the first time we've seen reductions like this, of this magnitude. We've seen tiny reductions in anti-amyloid therapies, but nothing thus far like this. So this is really encouraging, but again, very small um, numbers.
just to give you two examples of what that actually looks like. So these two individuals have tau cut at the beginning, and you see the tau is highlighted, especially in the, the temporal lobes. They were on placebo for the first part of that trial. So you see it's maintained, if anything, it's slightly increased. They then went on to active drugs, and you can see there is a clear reduction in the levels of tau, the tau burden on that PET study. Now that's terrific. We are now doing a study that involves 790 people, not 46 people. So hopefully we can validate these findings and hopefully we can start to look at how that correlates with cognitive benefit. Um, but there's a long way to go. That study has now started and it will be continuing for the next two years. But what I think we really need to do, and this is something that for, for, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, this is the sort of thing that I think we absolutely should be combining across basic science and, and translational medicine, is collaborating much more between industry and academia and adding value to these trials. So one of the complexities here is knowing what those CSF tau findings mean. It's a very dynamic process. And what um, Ross Patterson is doing is using silk. So he's using a system where you use leucine to act as a natural isotope that labels the proteins, and you can therefore monitor them in real time in terms of changes in the production clearance. And he's developed a collaboration with Novartis, with Washington University, UCL, who will be looking at what happens in real time as you give the antisense oligonucleotide to your production of tau and other proteins. And that's really going to enhance our dosing models moving forward and our understanding of what's going on with CSF tau. And just in the last few minutes, I want to turn to services. So this reminds me to reflect on our NHS. This is 2012. That's me as a dancing nurse. Um, I'm about to go dancing with a bed with a whole load of children on it around the Olympic Stadium, which is in the background. And this is, this is really NHS in its heyday, not me, but you'll remember how positive everybody was about the NHS at that point. And at the moment, the NHS is on its knees. But we need to, regardless of that, we really need to push forwards and grasp the nettle in terms of our services so that we can revolutionize them and be able to give these treatments safely. That, by the way, is me, third bed from the left from the end, and on the tube, quite excited after <laughs> So, this is our current provision across Europe. Red equals specialists and wait time to see a specialist if you've had a treatment right now. Green equals length of time to get an infusion because of infusion capacity. This doesn't even take into account the difficulties we've got with diagnostics in our country. And what you'll see in the UK is that you wait for evaluation if we gave treatments right now with our current provision for up to 14 months. Then you've got to wait for a bed to get your infusion. And the backlog continues. Look how many years that backlog continues if we don't get any more provision than what we've got right now. That realistically translates into a million people progressing from MCI to dementia. That's a hugely criminal thing to happen, and we have to do something to change that. The many things can be done. Many things need to be looked at, not least more resources, more people, um, and smarter ways of working. So this is one way of working more smartly. And I, I think if Tim's in the audience, Tim Whitman, he's also doing something very similar to this. So basically, ultra-fast MRI. MRI is long, it's expensive, patients can't access it. So can we make it quicker, therefore cheaper, and therefore more accessible? And Miguel Grillo is my PhD student, and what he's doing is a very real-world pragmatic study where he adds on five minutes of a ultra-fast MRI set of sequences to the standard 30-minute scan, and we compare the two. We're also using blood-based biomarkers as an added bonus if it's equivocal. The point is, is this non-inferior at this time, both in diagnosis and also in safety monitoring? So this is one example. One of these scans takes over five and a half minutes, and one of these scans takes one and a half minutes. I challenge you to tell me which one. Okay, in the interest of time. So, you knew what I was going to say that anyway. Um, so, the one on the right takes one and a half minutes and is actually slightly better than the one on the left. One of the benefits of doing scans really, really quickly is people don't move as much as they're claustrophobic. They can tolerate them much better. And so, what we need to do is think about things like this intelligently so that we can improve a pathway in Alzheimer's disease and in other diseases. And coming back to Barbara's 
comments earlier about brain health, the first thing we really need to be thinking about is increasing resilience. It's reframing so we're talking about brain health, not about dementia, that we risk reduce. And if people do get symptoms, that we're triaging people early and collaborating across primary care and secondary care, using new tools, again, digital cognitive tools, remote tools, will help us triage that huge body of people that may or may not have Alzheimer's disease that are worried about their memory. And blood biomarkers will also come into play here. We then need better access to diagnostics using things like ultrafast MRI and to work much more closely together in multidisciplinary clinics to develop individualized treatment programs for those individuals that may involve anti amyloid, may involve anti tau, may involve all sorts of other combinations. But critically, we cannot forget people that aren't eligible. I've done a trial, an audit of, of my patients with MCI Marv AD. 20% of them would be eligible for these treatments. So that's a huge population that are not eligible that I wouldn't recommend giving it to, but we cannot think of as kind of B-list because they're not on that treatment pathway and only focus on that. So I think this is hugely important in the future. And so if we can do these things, and if we can work from basic science through to translational medicine, if we can develop better targets and biomarkers and look at earlier preventative treatments, that's terrific, but we have to do that in combination with rejuvenating uh, our, and revolutionizing our services, having earlier biological diagnosis that is outstanding. They've sort of just produced new criteria for that recently, and developing scalable biomarkers that can be used out in the community. If we can do that, then we can start to build personalized, proper personalized, integrated medicine for our participants, for our patients, and our family. And with that, I will stop. I just want to say thank you to the people that I work with, fantastic people I work with, in particular my participants and their study partners. Without whom, none of this will happen. Thank you for listening. <laughs>